Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. I'm here in Scottsdale, Arizona with Cody Nelson, the optics manager at GoHunt.com gear shop. I call him the glassing guru. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. It's good to be here, as always. Yeah, we've got more uh, listener questions and, and uh, Instagram uh, follower questions here, so let's just dive right into them. Uh, Cody, we've got a question here that says, where does Maven line up with Swaro, Zeiss, Sig, Vortex for 15 power? I am not familiar personally with Maven. I've never looked through Mavens. Um, so, I mean, I'm going to lean on you for this. Uh, I've been hearing stuff about it. It seems like they're doing a pretty good job with their marketing campaign and such, trying to get their brand and brand awareness out there. But I literally have no no knowledge of it. I think it's, it's uh, you know, their their idea and what they're doing is obviously, you know, it's, it's a good idea and it's a good business plan and, um, you know, where they fall, where the cookie, you know, where the cookie, where the cookie crumbles, um, you know, they're, they're going to fall right in that, that vortex razor, you know, um, uh, 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 it's it just, and it depends on the, the glass, but it, it's going to be in that, that, um, it's going to be that middle, middle class series they're they're so you definitely not line them up with Swarovski like yeah size. I mean right now and in in and look and you know I don't sell them I'm not trying to bang on them you know I've met some of the guys they're good people and I like their business model um, I love the fact you can customize some of the you know I I, I think they've got great ideas um, you know I just uh, the the ones that I've looked through um, I know the history where they're come and and you know where those guys come from Um and I, I'm just going to tell you that I think that they're 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 tier two glass, and you know they're they're budget minded, and and I think that they they do a good job at what they're doing. For some people, they're the right fit. Yeah, I think I, it's like anything else. I think people's eyes tell them the truth, right. and if it works for them, knock yourself out. I think that's, um, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I just I have personal experience with with looking through those and and. It's, you know, it just, I think people need to go put their eyes behind them and, and let them, you know, let them decide. So, um, but yeah, I think they're, uh, they're a good quality piece. Um, but you know, do I think that they're the, the ELs or, you know, SFs or, or, you know, uh, HTs, um, you know, Noctavids? I don't. Okay. So, but Next. he, but he was more specifically asking about 15s though, right? Right. Yeah, um, I would tell you that that the uh, the Zeiss Conquest and the and the and the the Swarovski 15s are are kind of the ruling big sure. dogs right now. And then, yeah, so that's yeah, that's where I go with that. Next question: It says, uh, Jay, I listen to all your podcasts and love them. You recently gave advice on coos deer hunting, and I've heard before, and it's generally similar for many game animals. You stated that you should be set up before first light, before light hours. Also, you stated that the sun rises, coos will find shady areas and bed down. Um, my question is this. Since the consensus is to get out there while it's still dark and set up for glassing, do you think riding in on an ATV and using a flashlight of some sort will mess up your chances of seeing wild game? In, in other words, I can't physically move to the glassing points I want without some sort of flashlight while in the dark, and I need an ATV to get there. What are your recommendations for getting in as quietly in the dark as possible? Well, I think this is a whole podcast subject. I know. this is Because <laughs> none of them have been through the J. Scott School of, <laughs> of, of, of mitigating the, uh, what you can control and what you can't control. I, I think first and foremost, from my perspective, and then I'm curious to get your take on it, is you're always going to disturb stuff no matter yeah, what. You, I mean, it's it's just you're in their realm, you're in their element, and if you're not careful, you're going to disturb them. One thing I will tell you is on public land, they see enough vehicles in a lot of places where, you know, headlights, they're, they're used to seeing people driving around, not, they don't, you know, not necessarily hunters, but you know, there's enough people moving around the woods. They see that. Now I right. would tell you if I have a buck that I want to kill, I don't want them to see my headlights. I don't want to see it. You know, I don't want them to see my flashlight. So a lot of that is kind of knowing your terrain, knowing the country that you're hunting, knowing the Canyon where the buck is at. 
Um, you know, and sometimes it means driving in on your quad. It means using your headlamp, but then, you know, hiking most of the way. But when you know once you're going to drop mm -hmm. into the canyon or get up to the high point, you kill your light, whether that means you have to wait for gray light for, you know, you're at basically 75% of your hike is done, but you're waiting for that gray light so you can kill the light and then sneak on up to the glassing point. Because there's always a fine line there when it's you can see with your eye, but you can't glass really. Right. Um, and usually it's 15 minutes or so that gives you that chance to go ahead and get up to your final destination. Um, but for me, especially with coos deer, I mean for everything really, if you're other than sheep, um, if you're out there literally sitting, you have your tripod set up, your binoculars are already mounted, you have your pack all set up you have your spotting scope set up ready to go you know you've you've dug through your pack your water's out yep. you know your seat whether you're sitting you know in a stool or whether you, you know you're comfortable i love it when i'm sitting there looking through my binoculars trying to make out images right trying to see in the dark yep i love starting the day glassing in the dark i always feel behind if i'm walking in at gray light but I think to answer your question, like, you're going to disturb some stuff. Just make sure you don't drive through right. the basin where the deer are or the elk are that you're trying to harvest. Or make sure that, uh, y you know, y you do everything you can if you've got a buck working a certain ridge that he's not going to see your light. If he obviously sees your light, you have a chance that he's going to know you're there. Right. I never want them to know that I'm there if I can help well, it. I, I think it comes back to this. The statement that I said was it, you mitigate what you can. And, you know, I, I, I know that there's a lot of guys that I don't know why, you know, one of the things that I, I notice because I am one of the guys sitting there before, light and I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm waiting for it to get, you know, light. I don't know why people don't use red lights. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's do, a, that's a huge do, thing. Cause you deer can have it deer. I, I, I don't know the actual, but I do know that I've read that deer cannot see the red lights that, that we think that, you know, that maybe, I don't know, maybe people don't care, but Everybody walks in with these giant headlamps these days, and they're trying to light up the mountain, and I can see the light going. And I'm, I'm, I'm just over there going, wow. Yeah. Why don't you just tell them you're there? Yeah. Why don't you just start singing a song, too, because it's no different. I did get a kick out of some of my hunters. It's happened multiple times. They wear either the red light or the green light when we're turkey hunting, and we have birds roosted. I'll look back, and they'll have their headlamp on, and I'll be like, turkeys can see that what are you doing they're like they can't see deer i said turkeys can see red and green and deer can't and they're like oh i didn't know that but um but yeah, yeah i mean you I do mean, everything you can to i like to go extra early so i actually like to go in really dark and then let things settle well the, yeah it, that was the other thing i was going to tell you is, is i think you know trying to get there just at the time you can glass is probably I think you're running a risk. I think you need to be there early and have be set up and be waiting. Um, you know, uh, I, I turn my lights off in my truck. Is as I mean, sometimes I'll stop, turn the truck off, turn the lights off, and look, because if I can see down the two track where I'm going, and I, I mean, most of these roads I know where I'm going, and only if it's you know dangerous or technical will I. But I'll turn everything off as as soon as I can do it. Yeah. Because my little Toyota just, I mean, I can put that thing along pretty easily. Um, you know, and I, I i just try to mitigate what I can. Like, I try not to, uh, I know you, you're going to laugh at this, but I try to have everything in my truck in the... In ready the, to in, roll. Well, but in, in the truck ready to roll, I try to have stuff, you know, in the back of the the bed packed, you know, right. so it's not jumping around and... Clanking. Like, firewood's clanking and, yeah. you know, I, I know that sounds silly, but I just try to mitigate whatever I can when I can. And, uh... Yeah, yeah hopefully I, we answered that question. Yeah, hopefully. I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, there's a question here from Law Free. It says, looking for a tripod for backpacking to replace my heavy Manfrotto with pistol grip. Thoughts? We've talked a little bit about this on some other episodes, but... So he's looking for a tripod for backpacking to replace his heavy Manfrotto with his pistol grip? Um, wow. I mean, I'm assuming that he's using the old 222s and, you know, that thing, God, I think that was about a two-pound 
so we should be able to get him into something pretty easy. Um, what comes to your mind? You know, again, I'm, I'm going to go to that VA5. I think the VA5 is where it's at right now, and I think that's one of the best heads on the market. What about um, tripod? Tripod, right. you know, again, I, I would look at the um, Slex, um, you know, the 633 or 634s, uh, 733s. I'd look at the, the 290 Extras, the 190 um, Goes. I would look at the 1204, the Subaru 1204s. Um, I think any one of those tripods would fit the bill for what he's trying to do. Um, but you know, again, do, you know, how light do you want to go? And, you know, I'm a more middle of the road guy, but some guys, you know, really want lighter weight stuff. So I get that too. Got another question here. Uh, want razor 85 millimeter spotter. I have a slick 634 with B free Manfrotto. Can it support that? And what was the second part? Uh, 85 millimeter spotter. I have a slick 634 with beefy Manfrotto head. He yeah. must have the beefy float. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if it's the, as long as it's not a ball head, um, I'm not a big fan of ball heads. Um, some of them are better than others. Uh, but the uh, as long as it's the, the beefy fluid head, um, that will easily hold the weight of that spotter. And, and it, I mean, it'll do an okay job. It'll do okay. Next question is 10 by 42 versus 10 by 50. <laughs> Before you answer that question, um, talk a little bit about the actual details of a 10 by 42 and a 10 by 50. You talked about exit pupil. Yeah, so the exit. biggest difference is you're going to see um, the field of views are going to be similar, but the exit pupils are going to be different. You're going to have like a 4.2 millimeter um, on a, a 1042 exit pupil. And if people don't understand that, that's the band, that's the width of the band of light touching your eye. And then on a 1050, you're going to have a five millimeter. So um, I and would... What does that mean? The higher the number, the well, more light? Yeah, the higher the number, the more light that's reaching your eye. So, um, you know, my dad um, typically always glasses or tries to grab for like a seven by, you know, the old school, like seven by fifties. He wants as much light to his eye as possible. And the reason is, is because his eyes don't react to light like mine do. And my eyes don't react to light like my sons do. So there's kind of a, you know, there's, there's kind of an age thing in there that the older we get, the, the, the less your eyes will start reflecting or uh, re, uh, reacting to the light changes. So um, a lot of older, you know, hunters, because of their eyes, will start, you know, um, literally trying to uh, move towards, you know, brighter glass. Sure. So um, when, you, when you do that, um, um, I, 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 I think the difference between the two, if I was going to mount my binoculars on a tripod most of the time, I'd, I'd lean myself towards a 10 by 50. I think that's, you know, um, and they're not overly big to be on your chest. Um, the, you know, and I'm, you know, I just, I always want the best and the most advantage I can get. And if anybody's looked through a 10 by 50 on a tripod at first thing in the morning. They're awesome. I, that's what I used to roll. Well, you, your I, your I old the 10, SLCs. Yeah, the 1050 yeah. SLCs. I used them forever. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's guys that, you know. There's still guys to this day that, 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 you know, that now that they don't do the 1050s, everybody gets the 1050 ELs. And I just don't think people realize how bright those are. I mean, they're ridiculously bright at, at first light. And, and, uh, so I, I mean, if you're going to be on a tripod a lot, I, I'd go with the 1050s. If, if you're really just buying the 1042s for a net glass, then go with the lighter ones got a question that slipped in here but i'll answer it says what would it take for you jay to root for the wildcats <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> um, oh i'm sure that that would be expensive oh uh, yeah um i actually find myself when u of a is playing other teams other than asu i tend to i've kind of changed and morphed and i kind of go for them just because it's Arizona, but it used to be, I would, I would go for anybody other than the Wildcats, but I'm the older I get a little more, a uh, little more gracious I get, but, uh, I, sure, I actually, I took I a think, lot of pride. In I the was going to say, I, I think in the that. last game you took some pride, but 
I think you actually were nice to somebody that was a wildcat that you said, hey, nice game, or I, I don't know what it was, but I'm like, wow, Jay's come a long way. Yeah, what you probably didn't see is the direct message where I gave him a really hard time. Um, okay, next question. Looking for an update from Cody on the new slick tripod line he mentioned on the last podcast. Have you gotten any more information? Because um, I know they changed a bunch of numbers and stuff. Yeah, they, they um, I finally got, um, and I would urge people to look at slick.com. Basically, what they did was is that they 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 kind of reconfigured some of the compact sizes and how you know whether they're compact or whether they use four or five leg extensions. And so, I would urge people to look at Slick.com and look at the the chart that they have. Um, I think it's very useful. Um, you can call me; I'd be more than happy to go through it with you. Um, it it it. Uh, they kind of kept everything virtually the same. Um, you know, the prices um, went up a little bit. Um, they're not the, you know, the, the sale that they had going on at the end of the year or through the fall anyway. Um, that was kind of pre, you know, these new part numbers. So long story short, there's, there's just some different sizes. And I think it was enough to change that they had, they, they couldn't call them the same thing. They had to change the numbers because of the size differences. Okay. So you mentioned something there. You're talking about leg sizes. I want to, you know, kind of dive into this question a little bit because you talk about a three leg, a four leg, or, well, a two leg, a three leg, a four leg, a five leg mm-hmm. tripod. And basically what you're doing when you get into that four leg tripod, the overall length of your total tripod when it's all pushed down or squeezed together it's more is, compact is shorter it's more compact right whereas a two-leg tripod or a three-leg tripod it's actually going to be longer in length correct the you would always think that a more compact tripod is better because it's smaller in your pack and what have you the downside to having shorter legs is your uh the, your your lower lengths the, become less stable. Right. So every time you have a different quote unquote joint, let's call it, or uh, where your twist locks or your flip lock, whatever you're using, it's it's not as strong as say a two legged tripod or even right. let's just say a one legged tripod is going to be stronger. one leg extension. Tri- one leg yeah. extension is going to be uh, more sturdy than four different legs or three different legs out because you're basically getting less sturdy as you go out correct Correct. yep so there's Um, a fine line there and that's you know that's one of the things you know when you have you know when i've taught seminars and you know and people you know people look at you like you got a you know something wrong with you because you're telling them hey you know if you're sitting down don't use the bottom leg extension use the upper leg extensions because they're larger and stiffer and you know and they're like looking it's like do you think that really makes a difference and i'm like in the truth i think it does the farther you get away from the ground and the less stable the leg the more it's going to vibrate so i think it's a good idea you know i would prefer that that most tripods have you know um you know, three, you know, typically like that number I like is three leg extensions. Um, and even when I have a three leg extension, I really, I, I, unless I'm standing, which I don't, I don't, I hate standing in glassing. Um, again, because the farther you go away from the ground, the more things shake. So, um, you know, you could go out in the, in the, in the safe there and look at all my tripods. And I think the bottom extension, they look like they're pristine, brand new, like never, n- not scratched, not anything, because I just hardly ever drop them that low. And do not bring up the fact that I'm only five seven. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's make sure people understand what you're talking about. In those leg extensions, if you have a choice and you're not using all of the different extensions, mm-hmm. you want to use the last extension last. Yeah, starting from the top down. Right. You so, want to use the extensions from the top down because... And- that when you get down to the bottom ones, if you've got a five leg extension tripod and there's nothing wrong with them, I'd still have, I'd rather have a tripod than 
than, you know, or, or a five leg tripod than no tripod. Right. But all I'm saying is, is that, and there is a reason to have those sometimes because they're so compact and light that a guy's using them for a backpack. Yeah. Back, I get back it. doll sheep hunt or something. Exactly. But so what you're saying though, is as you're sitting, whether it's on a rock or in a, in a stool or on the ground, you want to either, whether it's a flip lock or a twist lock, you want to start up high yep. and go down rather than start at the, the very bottom, bottom extension right. and come up. So exactly. in other words, you want the thicker legs because as you go down, because those legs slide up into each other, you want to always be using the thicker leg, that sh- the thickest leg that you can. Yep. And the very bottom leg is the thinnest leg. Absolutely. Okay. And so that creates less vibration and a more stable platform. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly the, the whole purpose behind that. We've got a question here. It says, uh, midday, partly cloudy, 10 by 10 power binoculars. How far should I be able to glass muleys in the shade? How about with 15 power binoculars? It says, I know there are a lot of things at play. I figured it would be useful to hear about different conditions, optics, etc. would affect the answer. I hunt mostly above tree line in Colorado. So he's talking about midday, partly cloudy, 10 power binoculars. How far should I be able to glass muleys in the shade? And then he's talking, does it change with 15 power binoculars? Wow. I'm going to um, say with the 15s, you're going to get a little more detail oriented. You're going to get more magnification, yeah, I mean, and you should be able to look into the shadows better exactly. than a 10 power. You're uh, going to have more def- definition. And the only thing that changes this at all is, um, is you know, even when you have, um, you know, shade or cloud cover, you know, is, is the, you know, do you have heat waves or no heat waves or, you know, I mean, you know, those things change, but you know, the 15s, you should be able to kind of dissect and look into those shady spots. Um, as far as distances go, I mean, if, if, if all the conditions are per, I mean, I, there's no doubt that I love a good shady, you know, not quite, you know, storm cloud, but I mean, where you've got decent amount of light, but yet it, you're not getting that full brunt of glare. the glare. Um, man, I mean, I've got, we've a seen, mile? I, I was going to say a mile because, you know, I'm thinking a thousand yards, you're, you know, a thousand to 15 would be kind of optimum and, and, and a mile would be not out of the question. Yeah, not out of the question at and all. And I think with 15s, you could push that out to a mile and a half, maybe even two miles. I mean, yeah. depending on how much light you're talking, but um, that's where the 15s are going to be worth their weight in gold with the five more power, in my opinion. Right. When you're starting to look detail oriented in shady faces. Um, while we're on this subject, it's not a specific question that I got in, but I've gotten several of them on my Instagram feed because I've been running Q and A's and guys have been asking about me talking about glassing coos deer does it apply for mule deer and elk as well? But let's talk specifically like for coos deer and they hear me saying about nine o'clock in the morning to shift focus to the shady side of the Mm, hill. Absolutely. And with these December hunts coming up, um, you know, running into early December and then the mid December, you know, what they call quote unquote rut hunts. um, They want to know if that changes. And I'm going to say, you know, in most weather conditions in Arizona or Mexico, wherever you're hunting, it's still going to get warm for their standards. Right. So they're habitually used to, you know, doing their thing, but then they start in the morning to start to seek shade by eight or nine o'clock in the morning. Now, granted, if it's a really cold snap, they might bed right out in the sun. They, They definitely like to warm their body, but if it's warm, relatively warm or normal conditions i'm going to say still continue to glass a lot of the sunny slopes uh, and what have you for the first hour or two but then really start transitioning and i've had a lot of people send messages back since they've been listening to the podcast over the last couple months saying they're finding more deer right because they're looking in those areas of shade and it's just In my opinion, it's common practice that the animals are going to want to be on the shady side of the hill most of the time in the afternoon. So that means 
you know, glassing into the sun in the afternoon, which a lot of people are like, well, I can't see as well the glare and, the, you know. But fight it. Yeah, you got to fight it. Because you got to fight gotta, it. You got to look where the animals are. And, and well, and I, and I, and I tell people too, that when you do that and people talk about glare and, and I know that, you know, it's not like it's a magic thing, but the better optics you have, the easier it's going to be to, to, it's going to filter that light better. And, you know, I mean, I, I, uh, I mean, you know, some of the best in the business have said, Hey, you, you got to glass those, you, you, you can't take, you know, it's like who wants to stand there and glass into the wind. You're just getting beat up. But the fact of it is, I mean, yeah, you can pick the spot on the, uh, that's, that, that's on the lee side or, you know, but you're on the same but, side, but you're on the same are. side that the animals on. Right. So you, you, whatever that animal's doing, you got to fight your instincts. You know, that's why we all wear the good gear that we do. The, you got to fight your instincts and look opposite of what he's doing. Right. Because I mean, then you'll be able to see him. If he's on the same side of the hill, you're, you're, you're only seeing 10% of the deer because the other 90% is on the exact, exactly. you know, out of the wind or out of the sun. Now, if it's, you know, we've had those days where it was just brutally cold. Yeah. They'll seek sun. They will absolutely seek sun. And, you know, the, you'll watch them move from the shady side into the sun. And that, and that absolutely can happen. Right. And guys, um, especially cooster hunters out there that are listening with these December hunts coming up and even these over-the-counter January hunts coming up, don't uh, forget the fact that if you get those really, really cold mornings, a lot of times you think that first 30 minutes there's going to be deer popping all over because it's so cold. Actually, it's the opposite. They're going to conser- conserve their energy by staying bedded. And a lot of times things don't really happen till you know, 845, 9 o'clock in the morning when things start to warm up. So you've got to kind of watch your conditions <laughs> and when you've got those really cold mornings uh know that you know it's going to be a nine to three day and pretty much the other times they're going to be bedded because they need to conserve their energy yeah and you better bring a, some coffee or i don't know a way to cook up a cup of soup or something because it's going to be cold there's a question here from colorado mountain pursuit he says favorite optics company i'll answer that and cody's probably in a precarious position because he sells them all but um you know ever since i bought my first pair of 10 by 42 uh slc binoculars uh, i've been blown away with the quality of swarovski and um, i just think they have the wow factor it seems like a lot of the other companies are trying to you know keep up with swarovski uh for me personally you know i i'm i'm not in pay i'm not paid i'm not endorsed by swarovski but i really like swarovski um I like the people with the company. I've met some of the, you know, family members and such. Um, been to Austria. It's a, it's a pretty awesome company. But I think, you know, you definitely have those three. You have the, the Zeiss, the Leica, and the Swarovski, and it seems like everybody else is playing catch up. But the one thing I will say is, there's a lot of companies out there that are doing a pretty darn well, good job of closing that gap on the big three. Well, it's like you know that question about Maven earlier. There's, there's companies out there that these mid-level glass, I mean, they're pushing on that ceiling, you know, like, uh, um, you know, like Mike Jensen over at, at, uh, at, at German Precision Optics. Um, you know, there's a bunch of different companies out there that are just doing an awesome job, um, you know, at, at closing that gap. Uh, I answer this question. To me, the best glass and my favorite glass is is the one that helps other people see as much game in their time out there as they can. And that means again, what works for, for you. your eye, yeah. And that that's a huge it, because, point because it you know, what works for me, not your eyes might like something better. Uh, it's I, just I, like snow skis, like I can tell you what ski I like, but if you ski it and you don't like like you got to use what you well, are confident in. It, it's it, it, what my favorite one is is boots. Because you can tell me that you wear a certain boot and it's the greatest boot in the world, but that's great. But what if it doesn't fit my feet? Right. I mean, there's, there's other boots out there. Right. There's a lot of boots out there and you know, you, you gotta, you, you gotta, you know, you gotta figure out what works best for you. Mm-hmm. 
And yes, budget plays part of that. Some guys don't care about budget. Some guys do. Some guys, some guys are going to be successful because they used, you know, their, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, the old Zeist 1560s, you know, people would say, oh, those, those are too big, you know, but I still see guys out using them and they're still successful. Right. You know, so. got a question here. What magnification do you recommend for shots from a hundred to 1500 yards? Well, I'm assuming that's such a wide. Well, but uh, you know, and again, I'm, I mean, he's talking rifle shots. I'm assuming so. Uh, yeah, I mean scopes. Um, you know, um, I I personally like most of my stuff is in that you know three to eighteen power. Um. When I'm shooting at anything five or six, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I, I, I turn, I turn the reticle to where I feel comfortable, and it's not always on 18 power. But I'll tell you that, you know, typically speaking, out to that 500 yard, 600 yard range, you know, depending on the target and how it looks or heat waves, you know, I've turned it from 12 to 18 power depending on what I'm seeing, um, you know. Uh, I've had certainly the opportunity to use scopes that are all the way up to the 25 power. Um, I've used the, the, um, Swarovski, you know, five to 30, a number of times. So I think the, the most important thing that you take away from, from what you're doing is, is that, um, have the powers that are suitable for the job. Um, understand that the higher power you go, I've used this terminology before, but, Sometimes power creates more problems than it solves. And what I mean by that is, is that when you're behind the gun and you're on it, if you don't have a solid rest, I mean, you know, a 25 or 30 power scope may be completely a waste of time because you're not, you're, you're not, you know, solid enough to keep that, that steady. Mm. Um, most people maybe not realize that when you are behind the gun and you're breathing heavy and you're about to, you know, you know, shoot an animal, y- you you can feel and and watch your heartbeat in the reticle. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you've got to control your breathing. You got to control. So, I've just noticed that in certain situations that maybe sometimes power is not the you know the cure, um, but if if you've got solid rests, you know, sometimes power is great. So um, I think that's a question that needs to be talked about and what the guy's really trying to do. Um, but, you know, f- I, I, the one power range that I would give for that that I think works would be the, you know, the, the, the 5 to 20, the 4 to 20, uh, 6 to 24s um, would be real good for those. So, um, and there's a number of different options. You know, we have the, the loopholes that go six to 20. We have the six to 24, uh, um, you know, vortexes and we've got, um, some six to 20, uh, again, loopholes. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we've got three to 18, you know, the Swarovskis. It's just depending on what you're, what you're doing. Cody, I want to thank you for your time. You're obviously the optics manager at gohunt.com gear shop if you guys want to reach cody you can call him at 702-847-8747 he's extension 2 now he answers these calls himself or you can email him at optics at gohunt.com i also want to thank the other sponsors of this podcast and you can check them out in the show notes kuyu.com canyoncoolers.com phonescope.com and onyxmaps.com And you can check the uh, show notes for the different promo codes. And I appreciate you guys, the listeners, for tuning in to the podcast and giving it as much support as you do. And I encourage you guys to reach out to Cody Nelson, my friend of over 20 years, the glassing guru, the optics authority, and uh, talk to him personally about your optics questions, your optics need. And um, Cody, uh, do you have anything else to say to the listeners out there? Um, I just appreciate guys, you know, trusting me with their decisions and, um, it's fun to, to, you know, let people, you know, give people your experience and then, you know, kind of ask them what they're trying to do and put them in a position that makes them successful or helps them be successful. And, um, you know, I, 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 there's nothing I get more joy out of than, 
than you know putting people in a in a position to where they can literally go out and and either be able to to shoot or or you know find game. I mean, I just think that that's how important to you is it to be able to specifically talk and build relationships with people over you know long period of time where you can help them with different aspects of their optics needs. I think it's everything. I, I mean, I have people. I have people text me, I have people email me, I have people, you know, it's almost like you become part of their, I mean, Family know, they, like, I mean, we, I've had guys call me like immediately after they shoot and they're like, man, this, th- the whole thing worked and they're just excited and they, they can't wait till the next package or whatever they're building. So I think it's, uh, I, I think it's the personal touch and that, you know, that one-on-one and understanding and, uh, and, you know, just really trying to understand what a guy needs and wants and what's going to make him successful. So awesome, buddy. Well, thanks for your time. Uh, appreciate all your help on the podcast and I know the listeners appreciate it and thanks for your support, uh, with the sponsorship and, um, yeah, we got coos deer season knocking on the door here and, um, it's going to be another fun year. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think, uh, this cold snap that we're having. You know, I think if we can keep this going for a little bit, we might have a, a nice, uh, we might nice, might have a nice little early rut, maybe just a awesome. touch, maybe just awesome. a little bit. Well, God bless you, and thanks for all the work that you yep. do. Thank you, sir. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks for taking care of the J. Scott podcast. I listeners. always do. All right, buddy. All right, thank you, bud. Bye.